Well, this evening we're returning to Romans chapter 15, but in order to deal with the part that has to do with us, we have to dip back into chapter 14. So what I would like to do is begin reading in uh, chapter 14, verse 1, and I'll read through um, chapter 15, verse 4. Paul writes uh, through the church at, at Rome. Now, accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another any more, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Therefore do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength, and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever is written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening, and hopefully we can sort out what it is that Paul's talking about in chapter 14. Now remember that we saw this morning that Jesus did not come into this world to please himself. He didn't live for himself but he lived for others. And that's why he chose the hard road. Why he gave up the riches of heaven to live in poverty on this earth. There's, that's a big sacrifice we need to understand. We can't imagine. Well, we, have, we, we do have a down payment or as it were a foretaste of glory. We know something of the grandeur and the glory of heaven as we read scripture. But Jesus experienced those things, gave them up to live in poverty on earth. He gave up the perfect love and fellowship that is in heaven to endure hatred and the selfishness of this world. Um, 
He was willing to, as we saw this morning, speak the truth, knowing that he would suffer for it. He was willing to do what was right, even though others would hate him. He chose the hard road. He didn't seek to please himself. But we also saw that Jesus did this because he was looking to a greater pleasure, one that the Father had promised him. If he would provide the way for his honor to be restored, his justice to be satisfied, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who believes in his son in order that he might reconcile us to himself. So Jesus gave up his pleasures, didn't seek his pleasure in this world, that he might find a greater pleasure, and that pleasure was in serving us, in bringing us, as it were, uh, to the Father, in reconciling us together. Now, this is the example that Paul calls us to follow, that we should not also live to please ourselves, but find our pleasure rather in living to please him and by pleasing others, by considering them and not just ourselves. Now, I want us to consider first what Paul is calling us to do more narrowly because he does narrow down this subject in Romans chapter 14 uh, to this area of strong and weak faith, pleasing, not pleasing, and so forth, rather than more broadly as we looked at what Jesus did this morning. But we do need to see that, that uh, he's calling us to do what Jesus did. Don't just please yourself. Think about others. And in this case, bearing the weaknesses of those who have no strength. He says in verse 1, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Now we don't want to divorce that from the context. It's coming on the heels of chapter 14. And in chapter 14, Paul tells us essentially uh, three different things. He tells us that there's two kinds of believers, those who are strong in the faith and those who are weak. He gives us two examples of their differences, uh, those who can eat meat and those who may not, and those who observe certain days, elevate certain days above others and those who do not. And he tells us how to deal with these differences, at least how we should as believers. Now, we need to notice, first of all, that the differences that Paul is referring to in this chapter were differences that had to do with Christian liberty. He's not talking about things that are moral issues in and of themselves, uh, that are differences over what the Lord requires, although we have to understand the weak brother may have viewed it in that way. We understand that, that Paul isn't referring to moral issues. He's not talking about applications necessarily of the Ten Commandments. But what he is referring to are those laws that were set aside when, he, when the Lord Jesus brought in the New Covenant. He's talking about matters that have to do with the ceremonial law that used to be moral issues. Remember, before Jesus came in, Everything that God commanded regarding the ceremonial law had to be kept, and if you didn't keep it, there were severe consequences. You had to do it because God said it had to be done. So that's a moral issue. God says it, we need to do it. But it's not moral in and of itself. It's something that the Lord can set aside, and he did set aside when Jesus inaugurated the new covenant, when he brought it in, when he ratified it with his own blood, on the cross. Every covenant that the Lord made was ratified with blood. The new covenant was ratified with Jesus' blood. It was set in motion. And when it began, these other things basically passed away. Now, these differences have to do with the dietary law, at least one of them, uh, what one may or may not eat, likely having to do with whether or not it's all right to eat meat that's been offered to idols. The same issue that Paul deals with in 1 Corinthians. And the second issue is the Jewish ceremonial feast days, whether or not they should still be observed. I do want to note that on this second issue of elevating one day above another, Paul is not talking about here the fourth commandment, which is, remember, the Sabbath day to keep it holy, because God would not tell us to do something, command us to do something that, that he instituted for our blessing that is for our good so that we might have this day all in common to spend with him and worship together 
only to leave it up to us now whether to decide whether we're going to keep it or not. You know, Paul isn't saying, you know, one person can do it if he wants to and another person doesn't have to do it if he doesn't want to. That's not what Paul's teaching. He is talking here about matters of Christian liberty, which can or may, I should say, may or may not be done. Now, secondly, Paul is telling us first how to deal with these kinds of differences when, they are, when they're basically not viewed by both parties as matters of Christian liberty, because I think that's where the, the problem comes in. If they both saw it as something you may or may not do, there wouldn't be any, any problems. So he's dealing with the issue of when a brother or sister, one of the two parties, bumps the Christian liberty issue up to the level of a moral principle. When Either they accuse us, let's say if it happens to be us, of sin, or when they're offended because we're looking down on them for holding the view that they hold. Now, Paul says first with, regarding, with regard to eating meat. Paul says this is how we should deal with these kinds of differences when it can't be proven, as it were, that this is a moral issue. The one who believes that he has the freedom to eat, the one who is strong in the faith, is not to despise the one who believes it's a sin to eat. You know how it is when somebody's looking at us and we're doing something we believe we have the right to do before the Lord, but they believe it's sin. And so you know what they're thinking about you and, and that can make you think you know, or feel a certain way. Paul says, if that happens, don't look at that person and despise them for that the one who may be weak in the faith, who believes that it's wrong. And on the other hand, the one who is weak, at least in, with regard to eating meat, the one who can't eat it, is not to judge or condemn the one who actually does eat. Now, he says the same is true with regard to observing the ceremonial feast days. The one who wants to observe them may continue to do so. And that we should put a certain caveat in here. As long as he doesn't add them, to God's commandments. We're going to see that there's a few warnings about, about doing that very thing uh, in this text. As long as we do not make salvation depend upon keeping the ceremonial feast days or matters of what we can eat and what we can't eat. You know, the interesting thing that I'm not sure that we all understand or, or hope, hopefully we do by now, that there was nothing wrong with a Jew who is a New Covenant Jew who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, there was nothing wrong with that person continuing to, to keep certain aspects of the ceremonial law, I think sacrificing excluded. Uh, we know that, for instance, on one occasion, Paul had Timothy circumcised, and circumcision was a part of the Old Covenant ceremonial law. We know that Paul himself kept the Jewish traditions. As a matter of fact, it was James who who told Paul that he should pay the way of these four men who were keeping a vow, that they might go into the temple and so forth, so that he could show all the Jews that he was still living according to the traditions, and the traditions being the Mosaic traditions. Paul was keeping them. But in his evangelism, remember, sometimes he would present himself as one who was under the law or under the ceremonial law in order to reach those who were under the ceremonial law, that is the Jews, as a, you know, he, to the Jews he became as a Jew. And to the Gentiles who were not under the law, he became as one who was not under law so that he might reach out to them, although he also adds, but not without the law of Christ, that's the moral law, he, he wouldn't give that up. So he would seek to do what he could, become all things to all men, as long as he didn't sin by so doing. It was okay to keep the traditions, but if you happen to slip over like the Judaizers did and begin to believe and teach that you, you must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but you also have to keep this ceremonial law in order to be saved, then what you've done is you've added works to salvation. And Paul soundly condemns that in Galatians 5, verses 1 through 4, I say to you who receive circumcision that you have fallen from grace. You have been severed from Christ. That's pretty serious. Now, it wasn't just because of the circumcision. It was because the Judaizers were saying you have to believe in Jesus and be circumcised. 
If you believe that, you've destroyed grace. But if you believe that one may yet be circumcised as a part of the tradition, like Paul circumcised Timothy because they understood his mother was Jewish, his father was a Greek, so he wouldn't offend the Jews, that was okay. So here again, he's talking about you know, keeping the traditions. You may or you may not do that. And he says, if you believe that you can do that, and that's a good thing to do, then go ahead and, and do that. But he also says the one who believes that they shouldn't be observed, who believes that observing them would be, and there are some who believe this, would, would be to basically disregard what Jesus did and say that, you know, he really, you know, if you, if you continue to observe these different feast days, which we're all looking forward to Jesus, then you're basically saying that Jesus, the work that he did made no difference. Well, those who believe that shouldn't then keep them. They had the liberty either to do or not to do these things. Both may do as their conscience dictates. And Paul reminds us, though, that we're all going to stand before the Lord. We're all going to have to give an account to Him. He's the one who will ultimately judge whether we were right or wrong in the things that we believed. And that's why I think Paul adds that to say that we need to be convinced. You know, we shouldn't judge one another. God is the judge. You know, one, we all live or die. We are the Lord's. Uh, we, we live to please Him and so forth. But ultimately, we may be mistaken, so we need to make sure that what we're doing is what the Lord allows us to do. We need to be convinced that what we're doing is right and not judge and condemn uh, others or be condemned by them for so doing. But again, having to do with matters of Christian liberty. And the confusion comes in the fact that not both parties are going to be looking at it as matters of Christian liberty. One of them has bumped it up to a higher level. If we disagree with a brother or sister, though, Paul is saying, over a matter of something that is Christian liberty, we shouldn't despise them, we shouldn't condemn each other for so doing, because he also adds, the Lord has received us both. But now Paul zeroes in on another problem in the second part of the chapter that can arise through differences, and that is when a weaker brother or sister sees us doing something that they believe is wrong, that they believe is sin, something that is a matter of Christian liberty. But they're still convinced that it's wrong, but they are encouraged to do it because of their respect and their love for us and their belief that maybe we are a stronger brother. And they follow our example, but in so doing, they end up violating their conscience. They end up doing something that um, they actually still believe is wrong. And so, violate their conscience and sin against the Lord. Uh, Paul is telling us that we need to avoid stumbling the weaker brother in this way. Paul says that we who are strong, we who believe that we have the liberty to do what we are doing in cases like this, should set that liberty aside, should not merely please ourselves. In other words, I know I can do this. I know there's nothing wrong with it. But this brother or sister over here is offended by it. But I'm going to do it anyway because I just I want to do what I want to do and, and I, I shouldn't let what they're doing affect me. Paul's saying... No, in a case like that, we need to set aside our liberty, not merely please ourselves. Even as the Lord Jesus, who had liberty to do many things, set all those things aside in order that he might serve and please us, ultimately save us. Now, notice here again that Paul is not talking about two believers who simply disagree both who are fully convinced of their own position, where one is offended by what the other one is doing. I mean, that, that obviously happens too. Sometimes one who disagrees with us, but who is really not in danger of stumbling, might claim to be the weaker brother in an attempt to get the other one to do what they think that they should do. By the way, there's a label that's been given to this. It's called the tyranny of the weaker brother. Perhaps you've heard this before. They claim weaker brother status, you shouldn't do this because you're stumbling me. But it's not really stumbling. It's not really causing them to sin. It's simply a disagreement. It's offensive. 
Okay, it's offensive, and that's different than stumbling. Now, R.C. Sproul says if we do this, we need to make sure we don't do this, but he says if we do this, it's, it's like a kind of legalism where others are attempting to bind our conscience by something other than God's law, uh, you know, by basically what they want or don't want rather than what God says we should or shouldn't do. Now, we're going to set that aside for just a minute and continue to follow through on this idea of what stumbling actually means, but we're going to come back to see how we should deal with these differences of opinion. Now, as I've said, what Paul is talking about in the second part of the chapter is a weaker brother who is encouraged to do something that they themselves believe is wrong because they see a stronger brother or, or sister doing it. Well, this, this is what Paul writes in Romans 14, or excuse me, Romans yes, 14, verses 14 through 15. He says, I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Now notice what he's saying here is be, be careful of the weaker brother. Don't use your liberty or what you think is right in front of your brother, causing him to do that same thing and then falling into sin. You see what you're doing there is you're hurting them. I mean, Paul goes as far as to say you're actually destroying them. Now, how does that hurt them? How does that destroy them? It's because of what Paul writes in verses 22 and 23. He says, the faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. Okay, you have this, this faith that you can do this, okay? Let that be your conviction before God. He says, you're, you'll be happy if, if, if what you're doing actually lines up with your convictions, that you don't condemn yourself in what it is you're approving. But notice the second part there. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Because what he's saying here is whenever you do something, anything, that you are not firmly convinced that the Lord says is right and good, then you're sinning, even if what you're doing isn't actually wrong. I had a, a teacher in college who put it this way, and it sounds kind of trite, but I think it gets the point across. If you think that it's a sin to drink a chocolate milkshake, even though under most circumstances drinking a chocolate milkshake is not sin, but you believe it's a sin and you drink it, then have you sinned or haven't you sinned? Paul is telling us you have sinned because you have done something you believed was wrong. You did not do it in faith. And so to you it is sin. Notice it isn't actually sin, but he says, He who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith and whatever is not from faith is sin. If you really don't believe that you can do it and you do it, then you're sinning even if what you're doing isn't actually wrong. So that's something we need to think about. So what should we do in a case like this, where we hold a particular thing we believe we can do, but we know there are the, those who don't have that same belief, who do not have that same faith, and we know that it might feasibly stumble them? Well, Paul says we should consider the well-being of our weaker brother, our weaker sister, and not exercise our Christian liberty, keep it between us and God, not do the particular thing they're struggling with in their presence. Verse 21, Paul says this, It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. He says we need to be thinking more broadly, not just about ourselves, our liberty, our rights, what we can do, and not care about what everybody else thinks about what we're doing. We need to think about how what we do is impacting those around us. And he says, far from doing things that might hurt them in any way, we need to give up those rights. We need to do what will help them. We need to do what will build them up. We need to do what will make them stronger in Jesus and not destroy them and not hurt them. This is what love dictates. 
This is what Jesus has shown us through his own example. Again, Paul writes in our passage in chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So, you know, th this is something that has practical implications, you know, in, in everything we do. And we actually had something that we had to think about, you know, in, in this congregation as far as one of our practices. Uh, and I'll, I'll just use it as an example. Before we started using wine in our communion uh, many moons ago, uh, we had to think about those who would be present who might think that it's wrong. Uh, maybe they think it's wrong to drink wine under any circumstances. Maybe they would think that we're sinning. Now, there's an added wrinkle in this case, because if it were just a matter of Christian liberty, we can use whatever we want. If that were the case, then we would say, okay, well, there are some people who might be stumbled by wine, so we'll just use grape juice and we'll remove the offense. Well, a complicating factor is that Jesus actually commands communion with wine. I mean, he, that was the example he gave us. We, we, uh, when I say command, you need to understand that sometimes we're commanded by way of example. If, if the Lord does it one way, we need to do it the way he shows us to do it. It has the force of a command. Now, when Jesus instituted communion, uh, the Lord's Supper, the last, pass, you know, the last supper at the Passover meal, the, the, the cup was wine. It was filled with wine. And it wasn't just unfermented grape juice, it, was, it wasn't just watered down grape juice, it was wine, okay? So now we have to ask ourselves the question, do we have the right to change what the Lord shows us to do? And our conclusion was that we don't. And, and here I thought it adds a new wrinkle to this whole question. We do need to remember that it's possible for someone to believe that something is wrong when it's actually right. And I suppose it's not necessarily adding something new to it, but people are going to view things differently. But here, if it's something that the Lord actually calls us to do publicly, then we still need to do it, even though there are those who will object. Now, we did decide also to include grape juice because we believe that there would be those present who actually would think it's a sin to drink wine, and we didn't want them to violate their conscience based upon this passage we're looking at. So we include that as well so that everyone can participate. So again, we need to think about others. We need to think about their convictions. We need to think about what we think we have the liberty to do and what maybe they believe they don't have the liberty to do. And we need to make sure we deal with that very sensitively, don't we? But now coming back to that other issue, what should we do when our differences really is not a case of the weaker brother? when we really just have disagreements among ourselves over matters of Christian liberty. Well, I've already told you, on the one hand, we cannot let somebody bind our conscience by something that the Lord has not bound our conscience by, because if we do that, we give up our freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are back to Galatians again. Submitting to that would be legalism. If submitting to that would be adding to God's law. Submitting to that would be, well, if you, of course, if you add it to salvation, you destroy the gospel. But that doesn't mean that we don't have the liberty to set it aside. Uh, even something we, we believe the Lord allows us to do so that we don't unnecessarily offend others. I mean, if we know somebody has an objection to it, why do it? When the Lord tells us that we are not just to please ourselves, but we are to please our neighbor for their good. We are to build each other up. We are not to tear each other down. It's one thing to avoid being bound by, the, by somebody else's scruples, but it's quite another to flaunt our liberty in their face. We shouldn't do that. That's not a loving thing to do. That's not what Jesus would do. The Lord has called us to peace. Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So in areas where there's a real disagreement, I mean, let's be sensitive to one another. If, if we're doing something that's offensive, 
let's just not do it so we don't create the offense in the first place. But let's do the things that make for peace. Now, that, I believe, is what Paul's addressing in Romans chapter 14. But again, I just want to just remind us of what we saw briefly this morning, the broader implications of this principle where Paul writes in verses 2 and 3, for each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification, for even Christ did not please himself. Now, Christ, in the examples we saw this morning, uh, we saw him doing a number of things that really didn't have to do with matters of Christian liberty. Well, I suppose they did. I mean, things that he gave up in order to minister to us, in order to uh, please us. And that is one. But we looked at it more broadly, not just in the matter of eating and drinking, but just in the way he conducted himself, the way he lived. Paul says, we're not here just to please ourselves. But as our Lord Jesus Christ was here to please his Father, remember he, he was seeking not to please himself, but his Father to repair his justice, to do what the Father sent him to do, to be that kind of man that, that the Father could approve of, one who lived perfectly. But in doing that, he also pleased us, you know, those who would believe in him. As Jesus did that, so we are to seek to please Jesus and the Father, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and our neighbors around us. Of course, we please them in various ways. We please the Lord through worship. We please Him through how we, how we care for one another and how we, we you know, serve and minister to one another. And of course, we please our neighbors, or at least what, would really, what we really should do for them is to reach out to them with the gospel. We need to follow Jesus' example. Now think about this. If we spend all of our time here in this world simply trying to make ourselves happy, moving from one pleasurable experience to, to another, then how is the kingdom of God going to move forward? How is that following Jesus' example? Remember, Jesus set aside what was pleasing to him, and he took the hard road. He wasn't looking for his happiness here at least outside of doing what his father called him to do. That was his delight and his joy, and it should be ours as well. But Jesus did not look for his happiness here, and he told us on many occasions, neither should we. Jesus took the hard road, the road of self-sacrifice, of sacrificing his pleasures here for the greater pleasure, and that's what we should do as well. We need to remember that our ultimate happiness is not here. It's still ahead of us in heaven. Whatever we might find in this world that we find to be pleasurable, that basically is tied to this world, it's only temporary. But what we will find in the world to come is eternal. So we need to remember that we're only in doing what we're doing, what Jesus is calling us to do here through the Apostle Paul, we're only setting aside a lesser pleasure in order to find a greater one in the way that Jesus did. And I don't believe Paul is telling us here that we have to set it all aside, that we can't enjoy anything in this world, that it has to be just you know, uh, self-sacrifice and work all the time. Now, it does, it does mean that with regard to sin and the world and things we shouldn't have. But we can rest, we can recreate, we can enjoy some you know, those blessings the Lord gives us. But it does mean this, that we do need to set aside some of those, perhaps most. And I think the more we do, the more we're going to be following Jesus' example. And the more good we're going to be able to do for him. And that really is the goal of the Christian life, isn't it? To become like the Lord Jesus. So let's just remember what the Apostle Paul says when he says this. What he's saying is, don't just think about yourselves. Think about others. Think about the Lord, what he wants you to do. Think about your Christian brother or sister, what, what you may be doing that might be stumbling them, what you, you may be doing that might be offending them, and bring peace. Think about the people who are outside the church who are without Christ and have no gospel. Think about reaching them. How are you going to reach them and do all these other things at the same time? And, and which is more important? Well, our Lord Jesus, by his example, tells us that setting aside our own pleasure in order to serve him, in order to serve the Father, in order to serve our brothers and sisters, in order to reach out 
to the loss that is more important. And it will, in the end, result in much greater pleasure for us. You know, we're not giving it up in the long term, only in the short term, in order to achieve a greater pleasure, a greater happiness, a greater joy. Jesus, for the joy, the delight, the pleasure, the great happiness set before him, endured the cross and considered the, the shame as nothing compared to the glory that would be his for doing what the Lord had called him to do. That's what we need to set our eyes on, and that's what we need to be seeking. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us, um, help us do that.